Hi, and thanks for checking out the hemp tour of the 2022 Milan No-Till Field Day. My name is Zach Hansen. I'm an extension specialty crops pathologist, and today I'm going to be talking about some common hemp diseases and offering some fungicide updates. Before I start, I just want to point out some really important resources that growers should be aware of regarding hemp disease management. Um, the first one is an extension publication we put out a couple of years ago, Hemp Disease and Pest Management. And this is kind of an overview of most of the common um, hemp pests and diseases that we've seen in Tennessee over the past few seasons. Um, now, one of the things that's changing rapidly in the hemp landscape um, are the pesticides available and registered for use on this crop in Tennessee. And so um, rather than relying on extension publications, I want to make sure growers are aware of where they can get the most up-to-date pesticide information. Um, and that's directly from Tennessee Department of Agriculture. So if you check out their website, um, www.tn.gov slash agriculture, um, you can navigate to a, a downloadable spreadsheet that has all of the uh, pesticides registered for use on hemp in Tennessee currently. Um, so you click to the agriculture section, um, TDA, click the by topic drop down menu, then hemp in Tennessee, resources for producers. And then finally, there's um, one of those that is, can I use pesticides on hemp? You click on that, you'll see a downloadable Excel spreadsheet um, that you can download onto your computer. And it has all the pesticides currently registered for use in Tennessee. So it's um, it's a nice resource. A couple other important resources I want to point out. Um, in 2020 and 2019, we conducted variety trials to assess a number of um, agronomic characteristics in hemp. And we also assessed pest and disease susceptibility. Um, and so if those are your primary concerns or really other agronomic traits as well, including yield, um, you can check out these extension publications and get some uh, evidence-based information on varietal performance in Tennessee. Okay, I also wanna point out um, the results from a field fungicide efficacy trial that we conducted a couple of years ago. So this is a trial where we tested the products that were currently labeled at the time for managing leaf spot and powdery mildew. And this extension publication outlines the results of that. And I'm going to talk more about those results in the next coming slides. Um, but that's also a nice resource if you're thinking about um, choosing pesticides and whether or not they work, are they effective? Um, you know, it's nice to have some field data to support that. Okay, so the first disease I'll just mention briefly are uh, kind of generally grouped into leaf spots. So there are a number of fungal pathogens that can impact um, hemp in terms of foliar leaf spot. Some of these are probably familiar to people who have been around agriculture for a while, um, like Cercospora, Alternaria, Septoria. We also see Bipolaris and Curvularia. So there's a number of um, fungal pathogens that can impact um, the leaves of hemp in Tennessee. Um, these are going to tend to be worse in field conditions, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some diseases we'd expect to see in a greenhouse or high tunnel versus the field, and we tend to see leaf spots being a little bit worse in the field. Um, these are also going to be worse when it's wet, high humidity, um, when there's a lot of leaf wetness, that's going to fire up leaf spot issues, and typically most of these are going to be moved around by rain splash or wind. So as far as management is concerned, I always like to start with cultural practices and then um, if all else fails, we can kind of switch and talk about chemical management. Uh, of course, you wanna start with healthy planting materials, so don't um, introduce disease material into the field. If you are suspicious of whether or not the, the seedlings or the clones are actually healthy, you can quarantine them for a couple of weeks, kind of keep them separate, monitor them and make sure nothing kind of flares up. Um, or gets worse during that monitoring period. 
Improving air circulation, thinking about your plant spacing, anything that helps dry the leaves out more rapidly is gonna help manage this disease, uh, limiting leaf wetness. So you wanna use drip irrigation, not overhead irrigation. If you can avoid working with the plants when they're wet, that can help um, to limit the spread of the pathogens through the field because when the leaves are wet, that's when they're vulnerable to infection. So if you're working with the plants, you're spreading spores around the field, you can worsen infections that way. Um, choosing resistant varieties is really important. And we have found some varieties in our um, variety trials that are highly resistant to leaf spots. And so we do have um, some really good information on which varieties are highly resistant versus those that are highly susceptible. And if you're interested in that information, uh, please do check out those um, variety trial publications that I mentioned earlier. And then last but not least, if all that fails, um, we do have some fungicides that are available for use against hemp leaf spot. So this is some of the work that my um, former PhD student Rufus Akinrinlo did over the past couple of seasons um, up in Greenville. We had field trials evaluating um, fungicide efficacy for primarily leaf spots and powdery mildew. So first I'll talk about the leaf spot results. Um, three of the fungicides that we tested had sort of moderate efficacy, and those were Regalia, Stargus, and Exile. Um, so if you look at that chart in the upper right, you can see the untreated control is that gray bar all the way to the right. And you can see Regalia, Stargus, and Exile reduced disease by around 50%, um, whereas DefGuard, another product we tried, did not reduce disease whatsoever compared to the control. So I wouldn't recommend that product um, for treating leaf spot, but Regalia, Stargus, and Exile work pretty well. They're not silver bullets and the other control, um, cultural control options should still be followed, but they can reduce disease by about half compared to no treatment. Um, you may notice Quadris is listed there. That is not labeled for use on hemp. We simply included it as sort of a positive control that is a product that we know works well against fungal pathogens in other systems, um, just to make sure the experiment was working correctly. But uh, currently, Quadris is not labeled for use on hemp, so it cannot be used legally. Now, if we look at powdery mildew, a different disease, and I'll talk a little bit more about powdery mildew um, towards the end of the talk, but the results here are somewhat mixed. Some of these products work really, really well against powdery mildew in the field. Um, those were Regalia and Exile. DefGuard, which you'll remember did not work very well against leaf spot, actually had moderate efficacy against powdery mildew, reduced disease by about half. And then Stargus, which did work well for leaf spot, did not work well against powdery mildew. And so this is why it's important to make sure you're diagnosing the disease correctly and that you know what you're treating in the field because certain products will work against certain diseases where they may not have e efficacy against others. And so that's really important. But the takeaway here, if you wanna treat powdery mildew, um, we found a number of products that were, well, at least two products that work quite well in the field, that being Regalia and Exile. And then DefGuard worked moderately well. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about results of a greenhouse powdery mildew trial where we expanded the number of products and found um, even more products that are effective against powdery mildew. So the good thing is growers currently do have a number of tools that they can legally use, and some of them are organic as well, um, that they can legally use to treat powdery mildew and expect to get pretty good results. Once again, uh, we did test Quadris here. It's not labeled for use on hemp, um, but as sort of a positive control check is the only reason it's there. So in conclusion, um, now this being the, the field trials that we conducted up at the research center in Greenville, um, Regalia and Exile were very good at controlling leaf spot and powdery mildew, um, even more so for powdery mildew, but about 50% disease reduction for leaf spot. Um, Stargus is effective only against leaf spot, whereas DefGuard was only effective against powdery mildew. So again, important to diagnose the disease correctly um, before you begin treating it. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, 
before we get to making the decision to apply a pesticide treatment, it's a good idea if you can to plant resistant varieties. And as I mentioned earlier in 2019 and 2020, we tested a number of different hemp varieties um, just to see which ones performed well. And we found significant differences among those um, regarding susceptibility to powdery mildew and leaf spot. In particular, leaf spot, some of the varieties we tested were practically immune, almost had no disease at all, whereas others were highly susceptible and really had severe leaf spot disease. So if that's something you're battling in the field when growing hemp, um, you should definitely consider variety selection in terms of a mandatory tool. I should also mention um, the, the work that we've done here has been focused on hemp for CBD production primarily or cannabinoid production. Um, so if there's audience members who are more interested in grain or fiber, the variety trial data um, may not pertain as much to you. However, the fungicide efficacy results still certainly pertain um, to anyone growing hemp because really anyone growing hemp can expect to see some of these problems cropping up. Okay, so moving on to um, some issues that we expect to see in greenhouses or high tunnels or any type of protected culture. Um, we normally don't see as much with the leaf spots, but we do tend to see powdery mildew flaring up sometimes very significantly in these environments. And that's because powdery mildew is kind of unusual. Uh, it tends to be worse under very humid conditions, but less leaf wetness. Leaf wetness actually reduces powdery mildew, even though it tends to flare up most other foliar diseases, um, which is really why greenhouses and high tunnels are a perfect environment for powdery mildew. It tends to be very humid, um, especially in the microclimates around the plants. Um, however, leaf wetness is limited in those environments. So the, the actual fungus that causes powdery mildew is called Golovinomyces ambrosiae. Um, there are a couple of other species, but typically this is the one we've seen in Tennessee. You can see some symptoms here um, in the field. You might see kind of a light white powdery growth on the leaf surface. It can also cause leaf distortion. Um, so that's what we see in panel D right there. So as I mentioned, um, as the name implies, powdery mildew does create this pretty easy to see conspicuous white powdery growth on the leaf surface. Um, the, the pathogen can survive on living host tissue, um, in weeds, greenhouse crops. So sanitation is really important for managing powdery mildew and other greenhouse diseases. So after each crop, you wanna really make sure you get all that crop residue out of there. You thoroughly sanitize um, the growing environment so that you're not having pathogen carryover. Um, this disease is kind of tricky because it can move through windborne spores. And so potentially, even if you practice really good sanitation, potentially you could introduce the pathogens through those spores. And I already mentioned the environment that's favorable for this. High humidity, um, but otherwise reduced leaf wetness is favorable for powdery mildew. Here it, you can see how severe this disease can get. So these photos were taken in our greenhouse powdery mildew trial. So we try to really ramp up disease so we can test these products um, just to make sure that they work under high disease pressure situations. So as you can clearly see here, there is extreme disease pressure here. Um, and all that white growth there you're seeing is a combination of um, fungal mycelia, which is sort of the, um, the body of the fungus, and then also the spores that, as I said, can spread um, quite readily through the air. So if you're a commercial grower, you'd never want to see anything like this, but if we're trying to generate spores to inoculate or infest a greenhouse trial, then um, this works quite well for that. So the best powdery mildew management we have would be choosing a resistant variety if you can, number one. Uh, cultural practices to reduce inoculum, so that's reducing um, humidity, increasing airflow, and sanitizing the growing environment. And then beyond that, 
we look at fungicides for management. We have a number of fungicides that work well. So as I said, again, um, my former graduate student Rufus did these trials in the greenhouse over the past couple of seasons um, here in Knoxville. And we had 40 fungicides across four trials, but only 15 of those were commercial fungicides, the other 25 being experimental products. We used two different cultivars for these trials, Bayox 2 and Sweetened. We chose those because we know they're highly susceptible to powdery mildew, and this was a replicated trial. A couple of the logos of products. I mentioned some of these already earlier, Regalia, Exile, DefGuard, um, and then a couple of new ones too. Luna Experience is highlighted here. Um, again, similar to the field trials where we use Quadris, Luna Experience is a good powdery mildew fungicide in other cropping systems, but it's not labeled for use on hemp. Um, so hemp growers in Tennessee cannot use Luna Experience, uh, but we just included it to make sure that we could get some control with a fungicide just to make sure that the experiment is working correctly. Um, as I said, we did inoculate these trials. So we took some of those leaves with a lot of powdery mildew on them, um, counted the spores in a, in a water solution, sprayed them onto the plants, and then applied these treatments either before or after inoculation. Most of the treatments were applied before. Um, and that's another point that's important to raise is that with any of these diseases and powdery mildew is no exception, it's best to get these products applied before disease develops because that's when you're gonna get the best control. A lot of these products are protectants. So that means the product has to be on the leaf surface before the spore arrives to protect the plant. If the spore infects the plant, the product going over the top is probably not going to be as impactful for management. Um, in that case, you'd need a systemic product, that being a product that can pass through and into the tissues of the plant. Um, but the products we tested in these trials are not systemic. So um, protecting the crops before disease becomes severe is important. And uh, across three weeks, we recorded the amount of disease on the crops and then calculated disease index. And AUDPC means the area under disease progress curve. It basically means how much disease occurred across the whole length of the trial. And then we uh, determined percent disease reduction compared to non-treated control plants. Here's a summary of what we found in these trials. So here, the number that we're looking at in that middle column is the percent disease reduction. So a high number there means we re reduce disease by a lot. So you want to see a high number. And you can see a number of these work very well. Um, so this is compared to the non-treated control, bonite sulfur, Cinerate, DefGuard, Exile, Millstop, and Regalia and Cell Matrix all had excellent control and reduced disease compared to the non-treated plants by 90% all the way up to almost 100%. Bonite sulfur um, reduced disease by 99%. Now, sulfur has been used for a long time to manage powdery mildew um, in other crops. So that's not necessarily surprising, but it's very effective here. I should also mention we didn't see any phytotoxicity with any of these, so they're also safe to use on the crop. Um, you'll see a difference there, regalia versus regalia with those three asterisks. Um, the difference was regalia the two quart version was applied before we inoculated. So again, that protectant application, whereas the other regalia with the stars was, was applied after we inoculated the plants. And you can see we still got good control with it, but a little less control. And so that kind of points to the fact that if you can get these products put on before disease builds up, they're really gonna work better. Some photos to illustrate these results. You can see mill stop, there's almost no disease there. Regalia, same, um, almost no disease. The water control plant, so the water was the non-treated control. They were just sprayed with water. Um, in the upper left, you can see all that white growth there is powdery mildew. And then sill matrix down there on the bottom um, had a little bit more disease, but still pretty good control compared to the non-treated control. A couple other diseases I wanna mention before I wrap up. Southern blight, this is a lethal disease. Um, you can see on the left there, it causes wilt. On the right, you can see that white fungal growth at the base of the plant. Sometimes you'll see sclerotia in there. Those are kind of mustard seed looking fungal growths and that's indicative of Southern blight. That's a lethal disease. So you wanna pull those plants out. Um, 
so they don't um, allow for a lot of overwintering inoculum to make problems worse the following season. A couple of close-up images of that fungal growth there. And you can see that white fungal growth really obviously in this photo. Um, rotation to a non-host or grass for two to three years is important. Um, deep plowing can bury the sclerotia and help manage the disease and removing diseased plants. None of the fungicides that are currently labeled are likely to be very effective against southern blight. It's a difficult disease to manage, um, as is fusarium wilt. So that's what we're looking at here, or fusarium crown rot. Um, there's a number of fusarium species that can cause this. Again, you'll see that wilt symptom similar to southern blight, um, but unlike southern blight, you won't get those sclerotia forming at the base of the plant, those mustard seed looking structures. But if you cut the stem lengthwise, you'll see this brown discoloration in the stem tissue. Um, we often manage fusarium with resistant varieties and other cropping systems like vegetables, um, but more research is needed to determine those in hemp. And then damping off, this is typically a seedling disease. Um, sometimes it's caused by inadequate sanitation, um, but you wanna make sure you're starting with clean seedling trays or new seedling trays. So if you're reusing those, you want to clean those with 10% bleach solution. Um, in the field, raised beds and well-drained soil will help with this. Damping off is often worsened by um, excessive saturation in the soil. So we want to avoid that. And that's all I have for you on diseases. There's my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to me or your county extension agent if you have any questions regarding hemp disease management, and thank you for watching.